Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our Health Links webinar today. I know that we're still having some people log on, but we want to stick to the time of getting started promptly so that we can share all the valuable information that we have for you today. My name is Michelle Hahn, and I am the Community Programs and Events Manager for Health Links, and I get the pleasure of working with all of our partners and community members to help create webinars to provide you and your organization with more tools and resources to help you build a culture of health, safety, and well-being for your employees. And in order to do that, we try to find content and presenters that align with the HealthLinks benchmarks and our standards. And today's presentation that focuses on maternal mental health falls into three of our six benchmarks, as you can see here. So it'll align with our organizational support, health policies and programs, and engagement. Before I introduce the speakers for today, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items for everybody. So if you haven't noticed, you are all on mute. We're going to be keeping you on mute so that we eliminate any feedback and problems with our sound. So if you have a question, please feel free to use the chat box that should have popped up when you logged on, or there's a question and answer box on your control panel as well. If you type in your question to either of those, I will filter them along the way. We'll respond to them during the presentation when we need to. Otherwise, we'll save five minutes at the end to answer questions then. We will also be recording this webinar. So if you would like to share it with your colleagues or other team members or would like to listen to it again in the future, we'll send out the link for that and it will also be hosted on our HealthLinks website under the resources tab. And then. I Again, we will be sending out a follow-up email, including the link of the recording, a PDF of the file, the presentation that you are hearing today, and then there will be a short survey that we would ask you to fill out and provide feedback on the presenters, as well as give us information on what other topics you would like to see moving forward. Today, I will be joined by two wonderful experts in the field of maternal mental health. Rebecca Alderfer is the Senior Program Consultant for Maternal Mental Health at the Zona Foundation, and she also works with the Dabosky Group as a Philanthropic Strategy Advisor for Foundations and Family. And she is joined by Dr. Jennifer Harn Adams, who is a licensed psychologist and has her own practice that specializes in women's reproductive health. And she also serves as a consulting psychologist for women's services at St. Luke's Hospital here in Denver. They're wonderful people and they have a lot of great information to share with you today and I don't want to take up too much of their time so I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca to get us started. Rebecca, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you um, to everyone who's on the webinar for, for spending your lunch hour with us and, um, and also just sharing your interest in this topic. Um, I think that our, our title is not the flashiest that you've probably ever seen. Um, supporting the mental health and well-being of expectant and new moms and families in the workplace, um, but at least it's informative. Um, we could have easily called it what I wasn't expecting, um, but then you might not have been as clear as to what we were going to talk about today. Um, so thank you again for taking the time, and um, we'll move forward, Michelle, with the next slide. Um, first things, I just wanted to share that the slides are, are fairly dense and we kept them that way on purpose so that when you receive the PDF of the slides, you'll have a lot of the content and the information right there on paper and you can refer back to it or share it with colleagues. Um, so we may not go through each bullet point, but we'll, we'll hit the highlights and then um, look forward to all of your questions at the end of the webinar. We've split the content up into three categories. First is just an introduction to perinatal mental health. What does that mean? What are we even talking about? Have you even heard of the word perinatal before? Um, and what is that time period? Why is this so important? So Jen is gonna be walking you through that and answering all of those kinds of questions for you. The second piece is around action. What can employers and healthcare purchasers and even employees in the workplace do to be more informed and supportive and engaged in um, the issues surrounding perinatal mental health? 
And we'll give some examples of that and some resources to start thinking through um, some of those opportunities. And then the last piece is really connecting you to a whole host of resources that are available um, and in keeping you informed of some that are even emerging as we speak. Next slide, Michelle. The learning objectives, um, these were, I think, presented to you when you signed up for the webinar, but we're going to do our best to meet all of them for you. Um, the first is that you'll um, have a good understanding of what maternal mental health issues are and that um, an understanding also that there's a fair amount of stigma around this issue that, that it's upon all of us to help um, reduce and lessen um, throughout, throughout, the, <clears throat> throughout the workplace. Um, that employers um, will know at least three ways that they can help support their employees' mental health through the perinatal period, and that you feel like you're connected to resources that are available to help women and their families um, with anything that they're experiencing. Next slide, Michelle. So we just wanted to, to spend a little bit of time setting some context for this conversation. It may come as a huge surprise to you, um, that first sentence that's highlighted and underlined and has an exclamation point, that perinatal mental health issues are the number one complication surrounding pregnancy. We talk a lot about other things that can happen um, in pregnancy and postpartum, um, but it comes as quite a shock to a lot of people to learn that mental health is probably one of the, the most common things that a woman and or their family will experience in the, the months before and after birth. And as employers and as folks that are, that are in the workplace, you also probably know that women with children are the fastest growing segment of the U.S. workforce. This is a big group of folks that we're interested in talking about. Almost 60% of women who have an infant younger than one year of age are employed outside the home, which of course is, is a much higher number than in past periods of, our, of history. More than 40% of working first-time mothers return to work within three months of the birth of their child, which is a really vulnerable time for the kinds of issues that we're gonna be talking about today. And over 60% return to work within 12 months. But while we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about women and mothers today, I don't want, to let, I don't want you to think um, that this is only an issue that impacts women. It impacts working dads, it impacts partners, um, and there's growing evidence that perinatal depression and anxiety affects fathers and adoptive parents too. It probably won't come as, as, as much of a surprise that 92, almost 93% of all men with children under 18 participated in the labor force. Um, but it may be more surprising that paternal postnatal depression is a common condition among men after the birth of their child as well. Up to one in 10 new dads um, can have paternal postnatal depression. And up to half of men whose partners have postpartum depression will find that they're depressed themselves. It has a huge impact not only on the person experiencing it, but also on their partners and their extended families as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen to walk you through what it is we're exactly talking about and to lay the foundation. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, oh, next slide. Thanks. Um, so Rebecca early in her part of the presentation asked the question, you know, why is this so important? Why is this so important for families in general and as well as in the workplace? And I love this slide because it really highlights how many women and how hard it is to know um, are affected by perinatal mental health concerns. This project, this photo project, was commissioned by um, the organiz organization Postpartum Progress several years ago, and the blogger Catherine Stone, who kind of put out the call to um, her readership, she invited people to, invited moms to submit photos from when they were at their darkest moments after their children were born. And these were the photos they submitted. Um, several of these moms had actually been hospitalized for suicide attempts just days before these photos were taken. Um, 
So I think it really just, you know, highlights how many women are affected, how much these women look like our neighbors or our sisters or even ourselves, um, and how important it is to really make sure that these moms and these families and these um, sweet kids are supported during this time. Okay, next slide. Thanks. So now you're probably wondering what are our um, perinatal mental health concerns. Um, in, in the field, we refer to these as PMADs, um, which stands for Perinatal Mood and Anxiety Disorders. And this really encompasses a wide range of mental health concerns that um, parents can experience during um, the, the period of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, they can vary in terms of severity, as well as in terms of how long um, moms and dads can be affected by these. And when we use the term perinatal, we talk about the period of time during pregnancy, during the period um, for the first year after a baby is born, and then two other periods that maybe we don't always think about. But this would look like the first year after a pregnancy loss, or during the first six months after a mom stops um, nursing or pumping or breastfeeding um, if the mom nurses at, for over a year. So if a mom nurses her baby until 18 months, she's still vulnerable until kind of that two year mark, um, which again is a period we don't always think about. So this slide just kind of highlights um, a few of the concerns that moms may experience during the perinatal year, and I'll go into these further, um, starting with the next slide. Okay, just as a general overview, um, depression and anxiety um, is very common even during pregnancy. Um, we know that up to a quarter, almost a quarter of moms will experience some symptoms of depression while they're pregnant, and that one in eight moms um, take antidepressants while they're pregnant. Um, a lot of times moms are reluctant to take medication while they're pregnant, medication for their depression or anxiety while they're pregnant, um, but we know that um, not treating this depression or not treating this anxiety can also have complications. Um, these, the complications of un untreated depression and anxiety include premature birth, low birth weight, and just some sort of behavioral characteristics after baby's born that may make bonding and connecting with that baby more difficult. Many of you are probably familiar with what we call the baby blues. Um, these the baby blues impacts up to about 80% of new moms, and this typically happens during the first two weeks after delivery. So although it's uncomfortable and it looks a lot like depression and sadness, it's often part of that normal, although you know, sometimes challenging transition after delivery, um, where moms you know, are feeling kind of sad and anxious and overwhelmed due to you know, all the shifts in their hormones after delivery, um, their physical recovery from, from delivery or from a C-section surgery. Um, you know, maybe they have an influx of family visitors from out of town, um, you know, or just maybe kind of juggling and getting to know their new role as being a mom. So a lot of ups and downs during the, those first several weeks after delivery are fairly typical. Um, moms maybe feel sad, overwhelmed, super anxious, um, kind of the whole, whole range of emotions. This typically resolves with rest, um, sleep and self-care and a lot of positive emotional support from friends and family during that transition. If we're finding that the, these symptoms of the baby blues aren't resolving after the first couple of weeks after delivery, or if they're very um, significant, mom might be starting to look at um, some postpartum depression. This is actually the most common complication of pregnancy and childbirth, and we know that it impacts up to about one in five women. Um, it typically looks like, like what we think of as being depressed, feeling sad, crying, having trouble getting motivated, feeling help, hopeless or overwhelmed. Um, moms experiencing postpartum depression also experience a lot of guilt or self-doubt about their role as a new mom um, and may feel that they're having trouble connecting with their baby or may perceive her baby um, as being very difficult or colicky, even when those around them do not experience the baby that way. Um, 
for some moms, they feel so overwhelmed or experience so much doubt um, in their role as a new mom that they might um, be starting to consider suicide or start to think that their baby's better off if they're not in their lives. And so, of course, this is, you know, an emergency and we definitely want moms to connect with their families and reach out for help um, to get some support around that. Um, it's also important to remind moms to also rule out health issues that may be contributing to her depression, whether it's anemia or postpartum thyroiditis, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, in future slides. Another very serious complication that can happen um, for some new moms is postpartum psychosis. Fortunately, this is very rare. Um, affecting about one in 1,000 moms after their delivery. Typically, moms who experience postpartum psychosis have a significant prior mental health history of bipolar disorder or previous episodes of psychosis, or perhaps have a strong family history of those, of those issues. Um, the high, highest risk period for this is the first couple of weeks right after delivery. And for some moms, they actually start, the symptoms begin to come on while they're still in the hospital after having their baby. Again, this is really truly a psychiatric emergency, and mom needs um, psychiatric assistance right away if she's having thoughts about hurting herself, um, or if she's having unusual thoughts or experiences that don't make sense, um, or if she's making a plan to harm her baby. And this is a little bit different from postpartum OCD, which we'll talk a lot about a little bit later. Um, so, okay, so next slide. Um, another uh, type of mental health concern that we're starting to recognize is potential, as being potentially more common than postpartum depression is postpartum anxiety. And there are several different kinds of ways this might present for a new mom. Next slide. So in general, postpartum anxiety kind of falls into two categories um, in terms of the symptoms. Um, moms experience a lot of emotional signs of anxiety, including a lot of worry or obsessional or scary thoughts. They may feel very irritable or angry or frustrated with those around them. Um, if mom's gone through some traumatic experiences associated with her pregnancy or delivery, she might be talking about having nightmares. And she may just be feeling very tense and on edge. Moms also report a lot of physical signs of anxiety, including um, racing heart rate, feeling like they can't catch their breath, um, feeling like they can't sleep even when baby is sleeping or otherwise cared for um, by a trusted caregiver, or complaining about stomach issues or muscle aches or headaches. We know that about up to 34% of women report their birthing experience as traumatic, even when there are actually no official medical reasons for why um, she might experience that as traumatic when, you know, it might be in a, a quote unquote sort of textbook delivery. Um, there are several factors associated with a mom experiencing her delivery as traumatic. Um, one, of course, is the type of medical interventions that were involved. Um, you know, if she was in danger of hemorrhaging or if there was some danger to the baby. Maybe if there was a lot of medical intervention like forceps or vacuum delivery or C-section, um, you know, or if there was um, issues with baby being born very early or needing to go to the NICU and having that initial separation after delivery. So those are things that we sort of typically expect moms to experience as traumatic. But several other sort of more emotional factors come into, into play about um, you know, that may impact a mom's perception of her delivery. And these often go under the radar um, and sadly are often dismissed by very well-intentioned family members and friends and even medical providers. Um, um, one is their perceptions of control during delivery. If mom felt like she had any ability to make decisions or uh, impact the timing or um, choice of interventions that happened, um, the attitudes of staff towards her, if she experienced them as being kind and supportive. Um, if mom, whether or not mom felt that her pain was well managed, she may have experienced discomfort, but whether or not that was something she felt like she could manage is an important element of this. And um, the other factor being 
um, if mom felt she was emotionally supported, whether by the healthcare team or her partner or, or other people who were with her during de delivery. Um, one of the main keys of determining whether or not a mom would experience her delivery as traumatic is if she experienced the events um, with fear or helplessness or horror. Postpartum OCD is another um, anxiety disorder that we're starting to realize is more common than what we realized. Um, what po when we talk about postpartum OCD, a lot of times when we talk about OC OCD in general, people are envisioning somebody you know, checking that the oven is off or washing their hands often because they're very worried about germs. But for new moms, postpartum OCD actually looks more obsessional and is more related to the types of thoughts she's having. What we know is that about 90% of new moms report intrusive thoughts related to their baby safety. These kinds of um, thoughts also impact new dads. They also impact grandparents and even um, childcare providers that are spending a lot of time with, um, with these new and vulnerable babies. And what we realize is that it's probably, there's probably some sort of evolutionary element to this where adults are just sort of primed to keep babies safe. And one of the ways that we do that in general is to kind of be very aware of any possible dangers in our environment. Um, and in general, most of our environments are pretty safe right now. Um, there aren't any saber-toothed tigers or vultures looming overhead, um, but we still have that drive to keep those babies safe. And so as we're in our environments, we start, we, we have the potential to start observing neutral things or at least fairly neutral things like stairs or bathtubs, things like that as being very dangerous. Um, and without knowing that this is a common experience for people who are spending time with new babies, um, those thoughts can, you know, be very scary and very unsettling um, for, you know, for people. Um, so one, one of the things that's important to distinguish is that postpartum OCD is very different than having intentional thoughts about causing harm to one's baby. A lot of times moms are very anxious and very scared about saying that, you know, they may have had a thought of what would happen if I dropped my baby down the stairs or potentially even having a very scary visual image of that terrible thing happening. Uh, moms are terrified of reporting those things. Um, and there's actually a recent story um, in the news that's kind of going viral on social media about a mom who did report those things and ended up um, you know, being taken to the hospital and threats that her baby was going to be taken away from her. And this is the very thing that moms are terrified of. Um, again, these thoughts are very different. These, the moms who are experiencing these, these thoughts are the ones that I'm absolutely not worried about because they're so on hyperdrive and so on alert about their baby's safety that they will do anything to keep their baby safe. Um, you know, where we start to become be concerned is when a mom is really experiencing thoughts that kind of fall into the more um, psychotic category, which is where having harm come to their baby makes sense for some reason. Maybe, you know, she's thinking her baby would be better off in heaven or she's saving her baby from some kind of danger, um, that kind of thing. But this worry about something scary happening to her baby is really not um, concerning in the same way. Um, Okay, yeah, so next slide. So thinking about these perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, um, we touched on this a little bit ago, but in terms of the people who can experience them, um, you know, obviously pregnant moms, moms who have recently been pregnant, dads, and even adoptive parents um, are at risk for experiencing depression or anxiety symptoms during that perinatal year. Um, in addition to moms and dads being impacted by PMADS, we also know that, um, that this distress can have an impact on mom's relationships within her family, whether that's with her partner or with extended family members or um, babies, um, other siblings. Um, it can impact mom at work. Um, in terms of you know, her interactions with her coworkers. Um, it may impact her perception that she can do her job at work or balance the demands of working um, and being a mom. It can impact her relationships with friends. Um, and if mom's 
experiencing her friends as not being supportive or she's worried that her friends will judge her that might cause her to pull back from her um, her support system, thus making her more vulnerable to having problems with depression or anxiety. And, you know, perhaps, you know, even more importantly, um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders have a big impact on baby. If mom is feeling so depressed or so overwhelmed or so anxious about being a mom or caring for her baby, that really can start to impact how she interacts with her baby and how that attachment goes. And that can lead to, you know, issues with baby's development as well, just because baby's not getting um, the kind of connection or feedback that they may need. So getting moms, um, you know, into supportive care and treatment and having her friends and family members be educated about what's going on with her is really important, not just for her, but for her whole family. We've touched on this a little bit before, but there are some risk factors for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders um, that you know we can keep in mind when you know when we know that there's a pregnant mom um, in our midst, and so that we can kind of reach out and be really supportive for her. Um, as you might expect, previous personal history of depression or anxiety, or strong family history of depression or anxiety, can be a risk factor. Current or past traumas can also be a risk factor. Um, you know, past traumas might include um, abuse or just really any kind of um, traumatic event, violence in the home or a car accident, you know, anything like that at all. But then also more current traumas that are specifically related to her pregnancy and delivery, whether, um, you know, she experienced a traumatic birth or um, a hospitalization prior to delivery or if baby spent some time in the NICU, that sort of thing. Um, stress, um, just general life stress and general life changes can be a huge risk factor for um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. One of them is a recent move. Um, so many parents, and it makes perfect sense, but so many parents are um, in the process of moving while mom is pregnant because they're anticipating the need for more space in their home. And of course, this makes perfect sense, but it is definitely um, a huge um, stress for so many families. Um, if there's any tension or, you know, perhaps even a breakup in the relationship while mom's pregnant, that can be a risk factor. Um, and then just financial concerns, perhaps if there's a job loss or mom's anticipating not going back to work, those worries can weigh on her and um, make her at greater risk. Um, health issues can also be another risk for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, whether they're chronic health problems that mom experienced even before getting pregnant. Um, these might also look like fertility issues or previous history of pregnancy loss, um, or perhaps health issues that have come up as a result of being pregnant. Um, so there's sort of a range of, of health factors to keep in mind for moms. Um, and if mom's not experiencing a lot of emotional support, if she's a single mom, if she doesn't have a lot of family in the area, which is definitely um, a huge risk factor for our families here in Denver since so many people are moving here each month. Um, or if she maybe is surrounded by family members or friends, but they're actually not particularly helpful. That's always one of the questions that I ask parents. Um, first off, you know, who, who is around you, um, you know, to help out right now? Do you have friends in town or family members? And, you know, people say, oh, yeah, my, you know, my mom lives down the block or, um, you know, sister lives the next town over. And then my, my follow-up question is always, and is that helpful to you? Um, because those are two, sometimes two very different questions for families. Um, one tool that I really love, which is on the post -pro postpartum progress blog, is this checklist for new mom mental health, which is a, a checklist that kind of outlines all of these risk factors. It's written in very mom-friendly language. Um, it's not very technical sounding. And it's actually also available in, I think it's up to 12 different languages, um, which is terrific because it can really, um, you know, be shared with a wide variety um, of families. Um, most moms, when I share it with them, look at it and say, oh yes, I think everybody I know could check off at least three or four of these um, risk factors, which I think highlights the fact that the PMADs are um, such an important issue for so many moms and new families.
Okay, Rebecca, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thank you, Jen. With a big sigh, um, that was a lot of information um, that Jen shared. And while most of you on this webinar, we can't, we can't see what all of you do um, or know what your role is, but while many of you may not need a deep clinical knowledge or, or even um, feel like you'll be able to use a lot of clinical information, it gives you a sense of how, um, what the spectrum of issues can be that, that new moms and dads are facing and also just the extent to which um, the transition from um, pregnancy and being a member of the workforce coming in and out of work is overwhelming in and of itself, let alone if you're struggling with some of the, the various mental issues, mental health issues that Jen um, laid out, you can see how um, all of that could snowball and, and make the situation even worse. And also how much fear um, and um, the likelihood that moms and parents in the workplace um, are really not interested in disclosing that they're going through these kinds of struggles with their employers or even sharing with um, their colleagues that they're really having a hard time um, potentially dealing with some of um, these mental health issues during pregnancy and postpartum. And so with that, we want to think about how you can be um, a, a, a sort of progressive, um, action-oriented um, person in the workplace or um, even in, in with your colleagues um, who might be experiencing some of this. I'm going to lay out several ideas for action. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, there's probably many more we could come up with, and folks might ask questions about that during the Q&A. But one of the things, um, another just point of context, is that employers are important influencers in this space. Um, employers are still the prominent healthcare purchasers in the United States. Um, in Colorado, as of 2016, 52% of the population received their health insurance through their employer. I know we've heard a lot about the expansions of public health insurance programs. Um, but employers are still a major player and have a lot of influence around benefit design, around quality, um, and around the way that people experience health and healthcare um, in the workforce. Next slide. So the first thing I want to do is call your attention to an action brief that was just released in December by the National Health um, Alliance for Healthcare Purchasers. This organization, if you're not familiar, um, they are the, the national umbrella of all of the business groups on health. So in Colorado, we have the Colorado Business Group on Health. There are others around the country. And their role is to look at um, providing value um, to healthcare purchasers and looking at quality and value as a key component of, of what employers are doing around their healthcare purchasing. This action brief is called Hope and Healing for Mental Illness is Possible. And I put the link right at the top of this slide so that you can actually see it um, because that teeny tiny snapshot is not visible um, on your slides. I, can, I know that for sure. And there are five recommendations that they lay out, um, of which I'm only going to highlight three today. And while the, the action brief is focused on mental health writ large, each of these is very applicable to perinatal mental health. Um, the thing about perinatal mental health is while it's specific to the pregnant and postpartum population, a lot of the issues around availability of providers and the way mental health is talked about in the workplace, all of those um, are, are things that apply both to mental health writ large and to perinatal mental health. So the three that I wanted to highlight for you is number one, evaluating and dealing with root cause issues related to in-network access to mental health professionals. And we'll talk about that more on the next slide. Number two is supporting access to a full complement of innovative mental health care options. Um, that there are lots of opportunities for employer for for people to access care um, and that it's it's very accessible to them regardless of what their situation is and number three is around developing innovative strategies to support engage and advocate for employee mental health and well-being so throughout the rest of these action points we'll kind of each one sort of touches back on these three recommendations from this action brief thanks michelle next one 
To the point about out of network or in network mental health providers, um, I want to draw your attention to a recent report that was released by Milliman. Milliman is a, an actuarial group um, that did an analysis around the Mental Health Parity Act. Um, and they found that for people that were insured through a preferred provi provider organization, um, that the in-network use and the out-of-network use for behavioral health care is completely out of whack with other kinds of health services. So for example, um, folks that were insured through a provider, a preferred provider organization had to use out-of-network providers seven times more frequently for behavioral health care than for medical and surgical outpatient care. The same frequency was reported for behavioral health care in comparison to primary care. Only 2.7% of these insured individuals utilized out-of-network care for primary care, contrasted with 18.5% for behavioral health. This points to an issue around not having enough in-network providers or the right kinds of providers to allow people to have access within their plan. And as you know, if you have to go out of network for care, that increases your costs. It increases the difficulty with which you might have um, in finding providers and creates more hurdles to accessing care. So to that end, I wanted to flag for you that there's an organization called 2020 Mom, who's a national organization. Their headquarters are in California, and they've done some work um, putting together sort of checklists that you can ask insurers around where they stand on some of these issues related to perinatal mental health. They have a similar survey for hospitals um, so that they can sort of see how they're doing across a range of recommendations to make sure that they're doing the best job they can to provide care and screening for, for women and families during this time. Um, I, I just put a screenshot of what the insurer survey looks like. Um, the website is up on the, the slide. And on the next um, slide, I just highlight a couple of the kinds of questions that they include in that insurer survey. Um, they have different sections around contracts and payments network adequacy, which is what we just touched on, pregnancy care programs, um, which would include um, you know, insurer-based programs for pregnant women, as well as um, some other sort of outreach and education models they might, they might offer, and then training. Um, and so within each of those, I just flagged one question out of the survey. Those are, those are what you're seeing on their slide. Um, so for network adequacy, one of the things that they recommend asking your insurer about the bundle that you're buying or your benefit plan is, do they have at least one psychiatrist trained in reproductive mental health that's available, um, either through direct access or via telemedicine? Similar, similarly around, oh, sorry, Michelle, back just one second. Um, similarly around um, pregnancy care programs, they ask about um, do the insurer's pregnancy care program incorporate perinatal mental health substantively into their education, outreach, and service model? A lot of times, pregnancy care is focused on height and weight and nutrition and those kinds of really important issues during pregnancy and, and doesn't either fully address mental health or make it a, a very important part of what um, needs to be talked about in those materials. Thanks, Michelle. Next slide. And that kind of takes us into another point of access to care. A lot of employers um, may offer employee assistance programs um, to, their, to their employees. Um, some of those are utilized more than others. Um, I think it's a question of, of how well they're marketed and, and whether folks know that they're available to them. But one of the things um, to think about is whether those employee assistance programs include mental health um, as a key component. A lot of them do, especially these days. Um, they offer mental health services. They have mental health providers that employees can call and utilize um, that, that are you know, confidential and um, free of charge um, to use. But also to think another level below that of whether or not the employee assistance program offers perinatal mental health expertise. Um, do any of those providers um, have any background in perinatal mental health or working with the pregnant population? 
Um, and are they um, able to access resources um, if, if somebody on your um, staff reaches out? Um, there's lots of ways to get EAP um, mental health professionals trained up on perinatal mental health. Um, or to provide it as a wraparound service for mental health. There are online training opportunities which are listed there. Um, and even um, Jen um, and Postpartum Support International has done um, some training with these kinds of groups as well. In addition, um, if your workforce, um, if your workplace does offer EAP or even if they don't, there are lots of online companies that are starting to offer um, sort of these perinatal mental health um, solutions as well. Um, one I know is called Maven, um, and there are more coming online as we speak, and we can, we can um, keep you informed of, of when there are more options out there for providing this kind of material. Next slide, Michelle. Um, and then this, this idea of how you can really support and engage people through this period. The website that's listed on the top of this slide um, is around um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment is currently running a large public awareness campaign around perinatal related depression. Um, they have fact sheets, they have posters, they have resources available. Um, all of these materials are free and you can print them off and you can hang them in lactation rooms. You can provide them to your employees, your supervisors. Um, they're actually launching a Spanish version of this campaign just within the next week. Um, so that'll be available as well. But some of the things that even you've learned today in this webinar about knowing that perinatal mental health issues are the most common complication in pregnancy um, that there are vetted materials readily available for you to have um, um, that you can place around your workplace. Um, these, are, these are great options and, and they're things that are already available to you. One thing that, that you may want to consider is workplace parenting groups or ways to informally develop social normalization um, for the transition to parenthood. Um, well, it's um, folks like to talk to their peers. You know, it's the books about what to expect, what you're expecting. It's nice to know that other people have had a similar experience um, and that there are safe places to talk about what you're going through and, and um, you know, what are some of the struggles of, of transitioning to parenthood. You, of course, you'll want to be aware of employee concerns about revealing a mental health issue um, or how they're feeling in the workplace. Um, stigma is a huge issue, and I think Jen talked about that a little bit in that some of these um, mental health, perinatal mental health disorders can present themselves in kind of scary ways, even though none of that might be acted upon or um, would be something that a person would actually do. Um, those are things that they don't want to admit to people. Um, you saw the pictures of all those smiling moms that are hugging their babies um, and the families that were taking photo shoots when really behind all of that facade, they were struggling with something that was serious um, and needed to be diagnosed and cared for. Um, and then of course, making connections to available resources easy and comfortable. Um, when you're pregnant or, or a new parent, you're so overwhelmed with all of the things that need to happen in a day that finding a provider, um, just making that referral or even accessing care can be an overwhelming thing. And a lot of women and families do not do it. Um, they may know they need help. They may actually even have been screened and identified as needing help. But making the connection is too much effort. Um, and so a lot of these issues go untreated. Um, and then they extend and can have um, ramifications for a long time beyond that. A couple of other things. Oh, sorry, Michelle. We'll get to resources in a second. But... Um, there, are more, um, there are more workplace action items that are coming online soon. Um, the Zoma Foundation is actually working on a project to help develop a new HEDIS measure for perinatal mental depression so that there is a standardized way of looking at insurers and providers um, quality in this issue and that'll be something that comes over the next couple of years. And there's also a steering committee of stakeholders that's working on a maternal mental health framework 
that includes employers, um, that includes the business community as a key component of that, both around raising awareness, around providing access to care, um, and also being an advocate and a promoter of making sure that this issue gets the attention that it needs. And with that, I want to turn it over to Jen for the last part of our webinar to talk about even more resources that you can connect to. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Rebecca mentioned that, you know, one of the most important factors of helping moms and families get connected to resources is making that easy. And here in Colorado, we're really lucky to have a great community of stakeholders and interested people who are really trying to help facilitate that for new moms. Um, one of the exciting projects that Postpartum Support International has been working on is creating a provider database, which will be, um, is being you know, starting to be populated now and hopefully will be up and running and available for community use in the next couple of weeks. Um, this was in partnership um, with Zoma and um, we're just really looking forward to um, launching this tool. This will be located on our uh, Postpartum Support International Colorado webpage and families and providers can link to the database or directory and um, search for providers who are experienced and vetted by PSI um, as knowledgeable in perinatal mental health um, and look on uh, you know factors such as location or insurance or um, rate for services all kinds of languages spoken all kinds of um, uh, qualifications and help moms with the hope that this will help moms and families find the support that they need that's going to best work out for whatever their circumstances may be. Um, we've been partnering with organizations like um, CDPHE and local public health agencies to kind of get the word out about perinatal mental health concerns, um, you know, do some public awareness and public education. Um, one project that you can see online is um, the webpage that we've launched in partnership with CDPHE that has a lot of toolkits for both families and for moms and um, for healthcare providers. And you can find that, and I think I've got the link in there on the upcoming slide, but it's postpartum.net backslash Colorado. Um, and again, there's just a ton of great resources there um, for the community. There are a lot of new parent and support groups out there, some of which are listed on our PSI webpage, um, but can be accessed, um, you know, kind of around the community. And lots of great online resources and print resources, which we'll go into further detail about in a moment. I think I may have gotten ahead of myself a little bit, but um, <laughs> um, again, post. Postpartum Support International provides a lot of support to the community and to healthcare providers who are trying to get moms um, connected to the resources that they may need. Um, we offer a warm line um, in both English and Spanish. Um, a warm line is a little bit different from a hotline where um, with a warm line someone calls in and they may or may not get a volunteer right at that moment, but they can leave a message and then the next available volunteer will call them back as soon as possible. Um, PSI also offers um, webinar type chats similar to what we're doing right now with experts um, targeted on various topics. Um, some are geared more towards moms, some are geared more towards dads, um, and those are available um, on a regular basis. Again, I mentioned the directory launching this month. Um, PSI also, again, in efforts to make um, reaching support easy, offers um, a closed Facebook group where moms can connect with other moms as well as PSI volunteers um, to just talk about the new challenges of being a new mom. Um, and then they also offer the Facebook page and you see the link right there. Um, and that's more focused on pushing out information and articles that might be of interest to, to new moms and their families and the people who support them. We have some similar resources here in Colorado. There's that um, uh, public education campaign that I mentioned a moment ago that we've done in partnership with CDPAT. 
Um, our local chapter also has a um, Facebook page similar to the one that the national organization offers. And on that, we um, post articles, again, that might be of interest to new moms and their families, as well as announcements about upcoming programs, support groups, and other kinds of um, things that new moms might find supportive in their community. Um, we also offer a closed Facebook group for therapists. Um, and this has turned into um, you know, a great opportunity for therapists to reach out to other therapists who have an interest in working with new moms. Um, so that if one therapist gets a phone call and finds out that the mom you know, really needs to use an United Insurance and that therapist doesn't take United Insurance, rather than telling mom, hey mom, you have to you know, go back to your insurance list or start looking online, the therapist will go into that community, that closed group and say, you know, hey, I need to find a United Therapist in Lakewood. Is there anybody out there? And then we, you know, kind of on the back end in our therapist network can help streamline that process of finding a therapist for those moms. Um, so it's a great, great resource and, you know, a nice com connection for the therapist community. Um, here's just a sampling of some of the uh, resources in the Denver metro area. Um, the Healthy Expectations Program at Children's Hospital um, is a wonderful resource for, um, for our community. They offer um, several programs, including their Bearing Hope Program, which is a support group for um, expecting moms, and then their uh, Mother Infant Therapy Program, which um, you know, offers a 12-week kind of class-like support group um, with a kind of a curriculum for new moms. They also offer a free support group that runs um, in the mornings. Um, they offer this at two locations, on Mondays at Highlands Ranch and Wednesdays at the main Anschutz Medical Campus. Moms participating in any of those programs have the opportunity to meet with a um, psychiatrist who's um, trained in perinatal and reproductive mental health issues for women. The Fussy Baby Network is another great resource for parents. As I mentioned before, sometimes when moms are experiencing postpartum depression, they experience their babies as being um, very fussy. And some babies just have some health issues or some GI problems that do make them very fussy. And so the Fussy Baby Network is a great resource for us here in Colorado. Um, for helping parents get some support about, you know, what, what is my baby telling me when they're, they're crying from four to seven every evening um, for getting some support around that. Um, Tri-County Health offers their Mama Talk support groups. Um, several hospitals around town offer support groups for new moms. And there are a lot of really great community-based programs here in the Denver area offered through um, places like the mom the family room, which is um, up in the Wheat Ridge kind of area, and some other, other similar kinds of places. Um, as Rebecca mentioned a few moments ago, here are some of the other um, organizations that offer information and blogs as well as trainings online. Um, mostly I'm just putting these here for your reference if you want to check them out later. Um, a couple of those, the infant risk and mother risk. Um, one, again, one concern that so many moms have um, is related to taking medications either while they're pregnant or while they're nursing. And so these two websites offer um, great scientific um, information about the safety risks and benefits of taking all kinds of medications, not just psychiatric medications, but all kinds of things um, during that, um, that perinatal period. And lastly, Colorado Crisis Services is a great resource for our community, for any family who's needing um, resources kind of in the moment or crisis support or any of those things. As probably many of you know, they offer support via um, the telephone, via web chat, and even via text. And PSI's recent, recently partnered with them and CDPHE to um, create uh, several training modules to help their um, crisis counselors be in, um, informed about perinatal mental health concerns. So if a new mom or um, a new mom's family member calls in needing support around this area, they have um, some additional training on that topic. 
And these are just sort of um, for, for your reference down the road if you're interested or you know of people who might be interested in reading um, some books or getting some more information on these topics. And there's my contact information if anyone has any questions um, coming up. Thank you so much. Great, thank you both so much for a wonderful presentation. That was a lot of information, but a lot of really great resources and some ways to help people get involved and um, just know where to go for help in this area. We still have a few minutes. If people have any questions that they would like to ask either Rebecca or Jennifer here on the line, um, please feel free to submit a question through the chat box or the question and answer box and we can field those for you. And if you are wondering about what family-friendly support looks like in your workplace, HealthLinks has been doing a lot of work on that this past year with our with several partners, um, our main partner being Epic, which is executive partnering to invest in children. So if you just want to get an idea of kind of where your workplace stands and how supportive you are of helping your employees in any stage of life, whether they're thinking about becoming parents, they might be new parents, they currently are parents, and trying to navigate what life looks like with many children or caring for um, their elder, elderly parents as well. Um, it just is a great way to get a snapshot of your culture and identify what resources are working and where you might need to get connected to more resources, such as focusing more on the, the perinatal mental health of things. So if you are interested in that, you can visit familyfriendlycolorado.com and there's a toolkit there and a link to take an assessment that's completely free and online as well. We don't see any questions coming through right now. Rebecca or Jen, do you have other information or things you want to highlight in the last few minutes before we let everybody go? Michelle, this is Rebecca. Um, just on the following slide, my information is there too. And if anyone wants to follow up um, after the webinar, I'm very happy to do that. Um, we do have one question, thinking of the access to care. I don't know if you see that, Jen, about are there enough psychiatrists or psychologists in Colorado who have this specialty? Well, um, you know, I, I always say, you know, having even more would be wonderful, but we have been working to, you know, increase the workforce around this area. Um, earlier this year, um, PSI at the national level came in to do a training up in the Loveland Fort Collins area and we had about a little over a hundred attendees and we're hoping to do another training this year. Um, so we're, and we've also done um, some trainings around running support groups for the community. We had about 45 people attend those earlier this year, or actually I guess it was um, last spring um, since we're in January. But um, so we're always working to do this and I mean, if, if, from my perspective, I always think we need more. So um, hopefully we can continue working on that. But there are definitely um, quite a few people out there who have had training or, and or who are very interested in this area. But your question about psychiatrists is a good one. Um, as they're really, we really do need more um, prescriber type providers, whether that's um, psychiatric nurse practitioners or psychiatrists or OBs even, who are well-versed in psychiatric medication for their patients. Um, so we're hoping to, through PSI, to partner with one, uh, one psychiatrist, Karen Horst, who's in our community, to potentially have her offer some trainings this year um, so that we can um, help increase the workforce around that area. Great. Another question we had is, are you also looking at how mom to adopt or use a surrogate are impacted by perinatal mental health? Um, here in um, Colorado, I, I'm not sure that there's anything, um, any specific research around that that's going on, but there's definitely, um, you know, information and research that, that is out there to support that. Adoptive parents, they, the, the official term for that is post-adoptive. 
depression or post-adoption syndrome. Um, you know, that new, new parents who, you know, come to parenthood via adop adoption or um, through working with a gestational carrier absolutely can be, um, you know, at risk for, for those concerns. Great. Um, there's another question about cultural differences. So are there cultural differences that might influence how moms understand mental health or that employers and providers should be aware of or any resources on the topic? Um, you know, I think, you know, in general, moms are probably very reluctant to talk about um, their mental health concerns while at work. And, um, you know, depending on her culture, there may be some different expression of that. Um, and I'm trying to think about how that would look at showing up at work. Um, I, you know, honestly, I, I think, you know, from a cultural perspective, because moms are, because of the stigma, as Re Rebecca mentioned, I'm not sure that it would necessarily present very much differently at work because I think so many mo new moms do hide that um, while at work. But thinking about if you have a, if you want to reach out to me via email, I could probably pull together um, some resources around those cultural elements for you, um, Jacqueline. So thank you for your question. And this is Rebecca. I'll just chime in real quick that um, we talked a lot about the fact that the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment um, has this big public awareness campaign going on. And they're launching a Spanish version of that in the next month, which will also have all those resources, fact sheets, um, business cards, posters, et cetera, that will be downloadable from their website. And they transcreate the materials rather than translating them because there are some real differences in the way that Latino families um, or Latinas think about these issues or would respond to different messaging. And so they've done a lot of work with that. Um, and there will be materials that take that into account um, for spreading the word and raising awareness um, from that work as well. Thank you both so much again for taking the time to present this great information and thank you everybody for taking the time out of your busy work days to join us for all of this. I know that there was a lot presented and a lot of great information so I just wanted to remind everybody that we did record the session so you can share it later with your colleagues or friends if you'd like to and then you'll get a copy of the presentation in PDF form so that you can have access to all of those links and know where to go and how to get there. So be on the lookout. I'll be sending that follow-up email within the next few minutes and you can forward that to your colleagues as well. With that I'm going to let everybody go and have have everyone get back to their work days. Thanks again. Have a wonderful afternoon and we will see you next time. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.